as always, there is an outline in your insert if you want to uh, follow along. Let us pray. Oh Lord, for many of us in our lives, we have had times like those disciples where it seemed as though we got no rest, whether it was raising children or working long hours or other ways. And so we all know that we need this time of rest, this Sabbath rest, and what a gift it is to be able to do that. So be with us today as we think about the connection between rest and compassion. Amen. Come away with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Here's a starter question to get you going today. What would a restful vacation or time away look like for you? Take, think about that and talk about it with the person next to you or turn around if you need to and talk to somebody. What would a restful time look like for you? Where would it be? What would you do? Okay, I have another follow-up question for you. Same idea. If you were one of the disciples and you heard Jesus say that word, come away with me to a quiet place, what would your expectation be? A, quiet little vacation. B, time to be with Jesus, just you and the guys. C, fun and recreation. Or D, anything but being with lots of people. Talk about that with your partner there. What would it what would you be your expectation? I don't know about you, but for me it would be D. Anything but lots of people. That and rest just don't go together most of the time. Because for many of us, just simply like getting to work can be a draining event. Now maybe not so much in Marion, but if you've ever lived in a larger city, Chicago, uh, I know there's someone here from Chicago this morning, right? It can be pretty draining, can't it, to get to work. You know, or if you lived in L.A. or the, the East Coast or Atlanta, Dallas, uh, it's hard. There are just too many blame cars on the road, aren't there? Commuting time gets longer and longer. Even the dogs get bored, as you can see in the picture. There's road construction. That applies to us this time of year. Y have you noticed that as you drive around? You're forever dodging barricades, dealing with the occasional road rage from a fellow driver. You know, back in, I think it was May, we were in uh, Kansas City to visit Eric, and Adam Hamilton was preaching. You've heard of him, I think, and, and he was, I forget what the topic was, but he was telling about a time he came up to a, uh, an intersection, and, uh, and he kind of went through maybe before the other driver thought he should, and the other driver gave him the universal symbol of displeasure, <laughs> as he put it, and it turned out it was one of his members. So he just kind of waved at them as he <laughs> drove by. So be careful, people, when you give that universal signal. So driving a car can be stressful. Sitting in front of a computer all day at your work can be that for some. 
or working all day with clients, uh, you know, if you're in a helping profession or uh, maybe in sales or something, that can be hard. Uh, certainly teaching uh, is like that. You get drained out. You know, what's the old saying about teaching? What are the three best things about it? June, July, and August. All right. You can only do this stuff so long before you just get drained out, right? And you need a break. That's how we're wired up as people. And Jesus says, get away from the crowd to his disciples. Come with me and let's go rest. In ancient Athens, a, a man noticed the famous storyteller Aesop. Remember him, Aesop's fables? One day he was playing games with some little boys. And this other man laughed at old Aesop, asking why he was wasting his time on such activity. Aesop responded by reaching down and picking up a bowl, loosening, it, loosening its string, and then putting it down on the ground. Then he said to his critic, now answer the riddle if you can. Tell me what this unstrung bowl means. And the man looked at it for a long time and was really stumped. He had no idea what point old Aesop was trying to make. And then he said to his critic, if you keep a bow always bent, it will eventually break. But if you let it go slack, it will be more fit for use when you need it. And you know, we eventually break, don't we? If we don't let the bow of our lives go slack on a regular basis by having enough sleep at night, having a day off, having relaxing weekends, going on vacations, we all need to be slackers once in a while to let the bow go slack. Jesus had good reason for wanting to invite his disciples away for a time of rest. They just returned from their first mission trip. I see the mission trip kids are here already. They're all excited about going on their trip Saturday. Well, this, in our story right before today's lesson, you remember last week we had the story of John the Baptist, if you were here, and what led into that was the, uh, the call of Jesus to go on a mission trip. And so they've done that now. And they're telling him about all that happened, just like these kids will do in August when they report back to all of us. Those disciples called people to repentance, which can be dangerous, as I said last week, if the person hearing it is a person in power. They cast out demons. They cured the sick. They gave and gave and gave, and now they were all done, and it was time to let the bowl go slack for a while with Jesus. And it's the same with us. No matter how your week has gone, no matter how much you've accomplished or how little you've accomplished, we have this time together each week to get away with Jesus and with each other for an hour or two we carry out this same rhythm that the ancient disciples did, and the first disciples. You see it there on the right, sort of a sideways figure eight, a, the symbol of infinity. One author called it the journey inward and the journey outward. You see it there. And you notice how this goes? There's a flow to this. You never stay on one side forever. You, you always are impelled into the other side. And remember that half of our uh, marks of discipleship have to do with the left side. Worship, like we're doing now. Prayer, particularly at home. Reading the Bible, ordering your steps in God's word, as the older hymns put it. But all of that is meant to give you, kind of fill you up Fill your cup up so then you can swing into the right-hand half of the symbol 
to love your neighbor, to be people of service, or we say in our marks of discipleship, to, to serve, to give of ourselves, and to be in relationships with people. It's not meant to be just you and Jesus all the time. It's meant to be driving you into relationships and then back into that, into that time with him. That's the flow of discipleship. Or here's another way to think about it. Many years ago on a winter evening, the sun had gone down in New York City. And a man from Europe, not those three guys there that you may recognize, but a man from Europe was visiting New York and wanted to call his friend. And this was in the days before cell phones. And all of you are old enough to remember that. The next crowd, I don't know about them. These little girls don't know that time, do they? So what do you do when you want to make a call in New York City and you don't have a cell phone? Well, you find a phone booth, right? And he walked in it, but he saw that it was different from the booth in his home country. And it was getting dark, and he was having trouble reading the tiny print in that big, big, thick New York phone book, trying to find the number of his friend. He noticed there was a light in the ceiling, but he couldn't find the switch. Didn't see where the switch was all around the side. And a man, a local person, walked by, noticed this man from Europe struggling to read the tiny print, and he said, Sir, if you want to turn the light on, you got to shut the door. And to his amazement, when he shut the door, the light came on. And he soon found the phone number and was on his way. Which reminds us of a little phrase or little verse Jesus gave us on the screen there. When you pray, go into your room and shut the door. And pray to your Father who is in secret. When we shut the door, the light goes on. The light of the Holy Spirit goes on in our hearts and in our lives. But when we don't ever shut the door, the light has a tendency to not come on. So shut the door in your daily devotions. Shut the door in quiet moments at home and prayer. And the light of Christ will come into your life so you can go out and serve. Now one other thing about this notion of time away, it's noteworthy that Jesus says it to them not when they're surrounded by hundreds of people, but when they're out in the boat on the lake. Did you catch that? We know that there's something restful about creation, whether it's a lake or a stream or a mountain valley or a forest or the ocean shore. And you could really say that Iwalu Bible Camp exists so that people, especially children, can come away by themselves for a little while and rest with Jesus. And I've said this before, but your faithful giving over the last decade to the building fund has allowed Iwalu to build places for people to come and find rest. New cabins, new lodges, a renovated pool. Now these disciples, especially kids, they come back not really rested. They're shot. They're They've given it all for a solid week, but it doesn't take long for them to get recharged. And something very powerful has happened to them at camp. And maybe if you ever went to camp as a kid or had your children go, you know what I'm talking about. And they come back recharged because they've been with Jesus in the woods or on a river or on a houseboat. But if you read today's story carefully, you notice something, that Jesus and those disciples really don't get a vacation, do they? Unless you count the boat trip across the lake. For as they go ashore, they are bombarded with people, both in the beginning of today's story and the end. They see a great crowd, 
But we hear that Jesus has compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Now maybe you noticed that our story jumped from verse 34 to verse 53. Did you catch that? Like 20 verses are skipped. What happens in that skip in the middle there? Well, what happens is you see it on the screen. You know the story. The sun is going down. The disciples look around and they see thousands of people. They wonder how in the world are these hungry people ever going to be fed, and they tell Jesus, send them home. We don't have anything to give them. They see a problem. Jesus sees an opportunity. And he says to them, you give them something to eat. And what follows after five loaves and two fish surface, thanks to the generosity of a small boy, what follows is a miracle, right? The feeding of the 5,000. And notice that Jesus fills both their souls and their stomachs. What's the first thing he does with the crowd? It says he began to teach them many things. You know, you can show compassion in many ways. And one of the ways is by sharing the gospel with people. Now, we do that in Sunday school, we know this, in adult ed, in worship, in small groups. But in the summertime, we, we keep going. This past week, we had day camp here for elementary kids, and they were taught many things. There are kids going to Bible camp every week of the summer, pretty much. And what happens there? They are taught many things. At Marion Cares, throughout the summer. There are studies done, Bible studies, text time, they call it. And down at the Lynn County Jail on Tuesday nights, some of you go there every week. And what's going on there? The old thing that Jesus did. He taught them many things. But you can't stop with feeding someone's soul and not their stomach. And so you see in the picture that what happened next Jesus says, you give them something to eat, and they did, and so do we. As you come and fill the food baskets outside this room for Crossroads Mission, as you give a mission offering for Matthew 25, a urban ministry for the poor in Cedar Rapids, or whenever there's a special appeal, you are very generous for things like world hunger. He had compassion for them, for they were like sheep without a shepherd. A compassionate heart changes the world. I like the old story about the monk who one day found, as he was digging around in the dirt, a precious stone, a priceless jewel. He put it in his bag, and a short time later, a traveler came and met him on the road and said, he was hungry and asked the monk if he had anything in his bag, just a scrap of bread maybe that he would share. He opened his bag and the traveler looked in and noticed the precious jewel gleaming in the sunlight. And on an impulse, he asked the monk if he could have it. And amazingly, the monk gave the traveler the stone. The traveler departed quickly overjoyed with this find of a lifetime. However, a few days later, he came back looking for the monk. He returned the jewel to the monk and said this, a request. Please give me something more valuable, more precious than this jewel. Please give me that inner quality that prompted you to give me this precious stone. What is that inner quality? What was it for that monk? It was compassion. Compassion, which flows from the heart of Jesus, our good shepherd. 
which flows into the hearts of his disciples, like you and me, and then is meant to flow out again to people in need. That compassion flows from the cross as the blood of Christ drips down on the rocks below. That is ultimate compassion. So you need to look at the world cross-eyed, so to speak, with the cross in your glasses as you look at people and you remember Jesus' words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Or as one author put it, as you see on the screen, if a man has not yet wept at the world's pain, he is less than the dirt he walks upon, because dirt will nourish seed, root, stalk, leaf, and flower, but the spirit of a man without pity is barren and will bring forth nothing. Do you weep for the world's pain? Do you feel compassion for the hungry, for the homeless, for the hopeless? If your heart has kind of gone cold lately, well, maybe it's time to go back to Jesus. Think of that symbol. We do run out of gas. Our cups empty out, and we need to circle back to that time away with him. For as we do that, as we close the door to the noise of the world, the light goes on. As we do that, we find ourselves becoming more generous, less attached to material things, to the jewels of the world, so that we too can give them away with glad and generous hearts. We too can have compassion on the people of the world. Let us pray. And, oh God, help us to live in this rhythm of discipleship this week. We have come to be with you, and throughout this week, may we take time to be with you. May we take time to shut the door so the light can come on, so then we can go out and be people of compassion. Amen.